Hello, my name is Paul Chatterton. I'm Professor of Urban Futures, and I'm delighted to be taking part in this virtual open day in the School of Geography in the University of Leeds. So for the next 15 minutes, I'm going to be delivering a taster lecture on my recent book, Unlocking Sustainable Cities, and some of the research around it. So I'm just gonna share my screen with you and begin the presentation. So here are my slides, and the title of my talk is Unlocking Sustainable Cities, a climate safe, prosperous future for all. Now here I am, this, uh, as I said, I'm Paul Chatterton. That's my email address and you can follow me on Twitter at paulchatterton9 in case you want to follow up with any questions or comments. Now, what I'm gonna talk about over the next 10, 15 minutes is something very um, central to contemporary geographical study. Um, the climate, sustainability and how cities in particular can respond. So where does all this start? Many of you might be familiar with this kind of graph from your study so far. What we are facing is an exponential increase in the amount of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere. And currently we're well over 400 parts per million. Now this is a unique set of circumstances which is, which is the whole context for the talk I'm about to deliver because it's creating unprecedented levels um, of warming in our atmosphere. And some scientists are saying we're heading towards um, a, a world which is uh, 1.5 degrees warmer um, than pre-industrial levels. So the International Panel on Climate Change are extremely concerned about what these levels of warming mean for future safety on our planet. And this is a screenshot of their report which came out in um, November 2018. This is a landmark study about how we can hold global temperatures to no more than 1.5 degrees of global warming because of that increase in carbon in our atmosphere. Now, why is 1.5 degrees important? Well, a 1.5 degree world uh, doesn't sound very hotter, but it has dramatic implications for how safe we can live um, in our world. Heat waves, freshwater reductions, heavier rainfall, extreme weathers, reduced crop yields, sea level rises, coral bleaching, the basic reductions of our life support system on the on planet Earth. And this is particularly important because 1.5 degree is a critical threshold beyond which we must not exceed because otherwise these, the safety of all of us on the planet will be compromised. And it's not just a matter of exceeding 1.5 degree. Every point one of a degree beyond that will make a less and less safe world. Now it's all about a carbon budget. To hold to 1.5 degrees of global warming we can only emit a particular amount of carbon into our atmosphere. The global carbon budget which you can see represented by the red wedge will be expended within 17 years at current rates of use which is an annual emissions of 41 billion tons a year. Now 730 billion tons will go in about 17 years as a result. So we have just over a decade to take urgent action and get on a zero a pathway to um, zero carbon use. Let's take this down to Leeds because we're here, here we are based in Leeds and many of you will be coming to study at Leeds um, in future years. Now, Leeds has a particular bit of that carbon budget as a result of the whole big global budget. And our bit in Leeds is 42 million tonnes of CO2. You could see it out there. If you looked out onto the street, you could make a big cuboid of it. And once we've used that, well, it's gone. Um, and we, are, we start to eat into somebody else's carbon budget. And that's where the issue of carbon equity is foregrounded. So that's our, let's keep this figure in mind, 42 million tons, and wherever you might live, Manchester, Liverpool, other places, they will similarly have a finite carbon budget, which they must not exceed. Now, this has caused great consternation with the political world. So the United Nations got together in 2015 and marked out a roadmap, a landmark conference in Paris about how we can get to net zero emissions fairly quickly within the 2030s to avoid this 1.5 degree of global warming. And this has been backed up in recent years by an incredible youth movement, a youth strike movement led, led by the Swedish schoolgirl Greta Thunberg and then Extinction Rebellion highlighting the um, drastic changes which will be forced upon us if we don't hold global temperatures uh, to no more than 1.5 degrees. And I'm particularly impressed by this youth movement who is emerging because this is an issue of intergenerational equity, that somehow it's the next generation which will suffer the biggest consequences and therefore we need to take drastic action um, on their behalf. And the most interesting thing for me as an urban geographer 
is that cities around the world, and in particular Britain, are declaring a climate emergency. Now, through 2019 and into 2020, um, so up to two thirds of municipal areas, local authorities in the, in the United Kingdom have declared a climate emergency to embark upon a radical decarbonation, decarbonization of their activities and drastically reduce um, how life is undertaken on their patch. So this is no longer an activist concern. This is something which every municipality in the UK has taken on board to think how can we respond to the clear scientific messages. Now, what I want to talk about in the remainder of the time is what I call a 1.5 degree plan. How do we create what we call a 1.5 degree compliant city, compliant with the science to hold global temperatures to no more than 1.5 degree of global warming? A civic plan. And I've got four aspects of this, which I'm going to go through. This is a kind of teaching we will be delivering with you at the University of Leeds. So the first one, so let's have a, have a, let's have a look at this roadmap because this roadmap is quite important. Now this line here, the top line is really important because that's current emissions if we do nothing. They, uh, this is Leeds, for example, and they will tick around 4 million tonnes a year. Um, but this dotted line is the climate route to safety. It's a great departure from the, what we call this business as usual line if we do nothing. If we continue to live the high carbon lifestyles um, which we continue to live. So how do we get onto that dotted line? Which is an important question because if we draw this red, red rectangle, everything under the line represents amount of carbon used. So using all this carbon in the red rectangle would be bad because that would commit us to over three degrees of global heating. So what do we need to do differently? The blue, the blue shape is our carbon detox. That's the amount of carbon any given locality, in this case Leeds, cannot use um, within the period 2020 to 20, mid 2030s. Um, so this is the amount of carbon we have to reduce to get to that dotted line. Therefore, the bit under the dotted line is our carbon budget. Remember that 42 million tonnes that I talked about. So year on year, we must reduce our carbon emissions um, every year according to this line to get to zero. So we only use 42 million tonnes by the year, mid, mid 2030s, 2040s, and that's a huge task much more than we've seen under, under lockdown of the current COVID crisis. So I'm going to look at four action plans to um, do that. One of the big blobs of carbon in life come from um, surface transport and, and uh, air transport. So let's look at this first one, car light, climate safe and socially just mobility, how we get around our cities. Now, how we get around our cities and places has changed dramatically over a small period of time. This photograph from the beginning of the 20th century looks how drastically different um, mobility has changed into the 1930s, 1940s when mass uh, production of motor vehicles came on loop, into the 1970s and 80s when more cities devoted their infrastructure to um, the motorway city, leading to current levels of gridlock high carbon use, um, poor levels of mobility between cars and non-cars, and in particular really poor air quality and quality of life associated with road congestion. So how do we get out of this um, car heavy, car congested world? Um, there's a number of other reasons we need to do this because of a whole bunch of things around the geopolitical conflict we'll be looking at in our modules, um, how advertising and psychology affects how what we call car culture is locked in. So one of the things we look at in geography is a variety of different disciplinary takes on something like um, the car based city, psychology and um, geopolitics, culture and advertising how all these things come together to lock in what we call car culture and of course it's also about air transport when we think about 70 percent of all flights are taken by just 15 percent of people we have some significant national debates happening in our country especially in terms of the future of aviation given that if we don't do much about aviation unchecked by the 2030s it will take up a large part of most people's um, carbon budgets but there are great examples on the horizon developing out places like Curitiba, Amsterdam, Copenhagen, Paris with e-scooters and our own city of Leeds is de developing a mass rapid transport system. So we're seeing a real revolution in what we call sustainable and active travel modes. That's walking, cycling and public transport because we know that these need to be part of the mix to undo our lock-in to um, carbon emitting um, car use. And it can be done. Look at this, Tokyo, 
one of the lowest um, um, car ownerships in the world at 0.5 cars per household. Helsinki plans to make car ownership pointless within a few years and Central Venice has, has, has seen very little cars in its history. So it can be done. We're not intrinsically linked to car dependency. And what we're seeing in the light of, in the wake of COVID and COVID recovery is a rush to install active travel infrastructure around our cities because um, public transport will be slow to come back and we do not want our cities more gridlocked. And because COVID is a respiratory disease, we don't want to accentuate the, those respiratory illnesses through poor air quality from car pollution. So new measures have been put in place to support social distancing for people for walking and cycling, especially uh, pop-up cycle lanes, uh, larger pavements, and lower speed limits. We'll see lots of this happening over the next few months, so do keep a watch on this. Now, the second area, how do we create an affordable net zero city energy system? Because our city energy systems are creeping uh, creaking at the seams through uh, their dependence to, uh, on fossil fuels, that's mainly coal, oil and gas, which are carbon intensive and pushing those carbon budgets to the limit. And here we are in this little, what we call the carbon interval, the carbon age. We are very lucky for the last few hundred years to have this uh, brief um, geological gift of oil, which has allowed us to live a plentiful life. This is the carbon age, everything we want on tap for many people, and um, from pharmaceuticals to transport to agribusiness and, and air travel. But how do we move away from this? Here are some examples we'll be looking at in the modules uh, in terms of low impact and zero carbon neighborhoods. How do we create zero carbon student residences? How do we create low car and car light neighborhoods? And down here on the bottom right is BedZ, a low carbon uh, neighborhood in Beddington in London. So there's some really ambitious strategies coming out of the city level to reduce their carbon. And here's my own house. I live in a straw bale house in West Leeds, which you'll be visiting on the course. Um, you can see one of the key things about houses is um, home insulation. So the red house there losing lots of heat. My house there losing very little heat because straw bale is an excellent insulator. So we're we'll looking at how we can use prefabricated natural materials to reduce carbon emissions from our home, which remember carbon emissions from our home is a huge piece of the jigsaw to get to net zero energy use by the 2030s. And it also can be done by local foods, community renewables and city owned energy. These are the kinds of changes which we'll be living through over the next few years and we need to understand and supercharge how to develop community renewables and local food to reduce our local um, ecological footprints to create more localised life which are less carbon dependent and increase well-being. So the third area is what I call um, a new city nature deal. How do we green our cities? Um, here's the um, story of the industrial city grown from its uh, 19th century origins and we get mass um, slums and peri-urban development in many parts of the global south. This urban model is expanding with mega cities across the world. It's largely unsustainable. How do we create a different urban model? especially since this model is putting nature under a huge amount of stress, in particular um, urban wildlife. So there are whole pockets of innovation going on, especially around urban agriculture, green buildings and blue-green infrastructure to bring nature right back into the city. And what we've re realised during lockdown is that life after lockdown will need to have many more green accessible spaces where people can socially distance. The fourth area, how do we create better quality public places, community assets, which can drive that COVID recovery and building local resilience? Well, there's a whole bunch of things which are wrong with our current models, uh, privatized city centers where we can't socially distance or we're excluded from, slum dwellers which are uh, too tightly packed, and poorly designed homes which are car dependent. How do we move away from this particular model of urban development? Well, there's a whole bunch of innovations going on, everything from local currencies and community ownership of pubs and even really exciting ideas like a universal basic income, which the whole of Spain is experimenting with, experimenting with or shifting um, jobs and factories to what we call socially useful production, making wind turbines and air pumps um, rather than fossil fuel machinery. And how do we get to what we call people powered housing? I'm involved and we'll do a lot of sessions on this on what we call people powered housing, community led housing, where communities design and deliver their own and manage their own housing. We're seeing examples right across the world um, from Amsterdam, Copenhagen, and this is, this is Bristol and even Wikipedia has their wiki house model. Um, this is my own project Lilac where I live and we'll be uh, visiting that in, in, in the geography um, courses to come. It's called Lilac and there's a website you could have a look at where we built a straw bale 
um, cooperative in West Leeds. Uh, so this is my book, um, Unlocking Sustainable Cities. You can see the website there to get a sense of it, what, I, what I've been writing. Um, you can see my email there and there I'm on Twitter. And um, if you want to follow any of this up, that's great. And I certainly look forward to seeing any of you that come to Leeds. I hope that's been an, an interesting glimpse into the kind of things we teach and research on in Leeds. And enjoy the rest of the virtual open day. Thank you.